we've now reached the point in our conference and our deliberations for a keynote address. We're extremely fortunate to have Doris Bergen here with us to deliver these remarks. Uh, you have a, a short biographical sketch of Professor Bergen in your material, so I won't repeat all of that. But let me say the following. Doris Bergen is the Chancellor Rose and Ray Wolf Professor of Holocaust Studies in the Department of History at the University of Toronto. She has written and published several very important and very stimulating books on the subject of the Holocaust and the relevance of Holocaust for contemporary genocide studies as well. She has taught at a number of major universities in the United States, in Canada, and in Europe. Uh, just by pride of position, let me say that Professor Bergen was a visiting scholar at the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in the first year that we had a fellowship program, and she currently serves on the academic committee of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, and in that position has for a number of years chaired our fellowships committee, and she's also led some truly extraordinary and inspiring seminars for American faculty who teach about the Holocaust at campuses across the United States and Canada. So a quite unique combination of research and teaching capability and really extraordinary experience that leads her to be our keynote speaker this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the kind words of introduction. And indeed, I wanted to say a word of thanks first to the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, where indeed I held a fellowship. It was a very uh, important opportunity for me. Um, and I want to take this opportunity to encourage those of you who haven't applied or had such a fellowship to please consider doing so. I also want to thank the people here at the um, Vienna Wiesenthal Institute uh, for Holocaust Studies for the very uh, wonderful work of organization they've done, and of course Krista Hegberg from the Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies for taking so much care uh, with this program and all the details of it. I will tell you that when Krista asked me to give this talk, she explicitly asked me to respond to the papers that all of uh, our participants in the conference have presented. So I've tried to design my talk uh, in that way. And as a result, I also need to add an important word of thanks to all of those scholars who have presented and will present tomorrow uh, their work at this conference. I think I'm the only person who has read all of the papers. So I have a sort of privileged uh, vantage point, and I can tell you it's quite humbling to see the remarkable research that people are doing on so many topics in so many different places. What I want to offer is really a series of reflections about the subject of collaborators and in a way about the broader state of the field of Holocaust studies. So let me start just by asking you to think for a moment about chronologically where we are in the field of Holocaust studies. One might say, in fact a friend of mine recently did say, that we are between two paradigmatic moments in this field. By that I mean the post-communist era, which beginning especially in the early 1990s brought an absolute explosion of attention in this field, with the opening of archives, as people often point to, but also, equally, maybe more important, with the institutionalization of Holocaust studies as an academic program, the availability of funding and other kinds of opportunities 
You know, there's a lot of archives available in a lot of places in the world. No one's going to use them unless there's some reason to think someone's going to care about what they find there. So 25 years out, it seems to me that perhaps we're in a moment where an enormous amount of work has been done, much of it very close-grained case studies, detailed work, filling in a kind of complex picture. All of this work has been accompanied by also a tremendous amount of popular interest in the study of the Holocaust, and not only accompanied by, but in many ways facilitated by. Right? The popular interest in the field has fueled the academic opportunities in the field. But what will happen next? What will happen next? Does this boom continue? Will new analytical frameworks emerge? What will be the next frames now that certain key issues we seem to have found consensus? The old center-periphery debate, it seems to me our conference on collaboration and many other events have shown we understand now center and peripheries interacted. That's how it worked. The old debate about perpetrator histories or victims' histories, now at least officially, we all do integrated histories. If you look at the papers for this conference, most of them make use in some way of Jewish sources. So what will come next? Collaboration, it seems to me, is a central topic in this question. Will the Holocaust increasingly be framed in the history of colonialisms, something that's come up a few times today? In the histories of genocides, as part of a world history of genocides, of modernity, a kind of European 20th century, Alexander Korb moved in that direction. It seems to me it's not clear and perhaps it's valuable to think hard about how our small pieces fit in to the next steps. I also want to say something about a theme that may seem awkward, the theme of discomfort. Discomfort. It's exciting to think about those possibilities for our field, but it seems to me there's also a certain discomfort First of all, in thinking about our subject at this conference to begin with, collaboration. And secondly, in thinking about how it fits into the future of Holocaust studies. We've heard a lot over the past two days, and we'll hear more, about the problems with the term collaboration itself. In many ways, it seems to me, collaboration is not really a category of historical analysis. It's a judgment or an accusation. It's a term that's been brought from a legal discourse. And perhaps it's time to think about how that discourse might be changed as the years and the decades since the war um, have passed. Of course, there are possibilities in English that don't exist in some of the other languages of our and your scholarship. Collaboration, as Jan Lanicek reminded us, has one meaning, traitorous participation with the enemy, but at least in English it has another very benign meaning, working together on a project. I have a nine-year-old son on his report card. He gets a grade for collaboration. No one's too worried about the Nazis there in his school, right? The question is, does he play well with others? In German, if we refer to collaborators or mittäter, there's a more ominous ring to the word. Probably that wouldn't be on the report card. And certainly in Russian, traders, izmieniki, is not going to appear on anyone's report card either. So thinking about the problems of collaboration as a term, it's also a linguistic question. In what language do you write your work? What vocabulary do you use? What flexibility is available to you? The term collaborator, collaboration, collaborationists, of course, comes loaded with a heavy Cold War baggage. It also comes with a history of movement from west to east. In the 1980s, when I was a student, 
If someone said collaborator in a room full of students or scholars, the image that would pop into most people's head would be Pétain, Quislin, or perhaps a French or Belgian woman with a shaved head. Now, if I say that word to my students, the image that comes to their head is a Polish peasant. Right? So I think collaboration as a sort of popular understanding has moved from west to east, from state to private. Um, and those changes affect the work that we do, the work that you do. Many of our papers describe the need to nuance the term, perhaps even to reject it altogether. Sławomir Kapralski offered us some interesting nuances, thinking about collaboration, complicity, and involvement. Alexander Korb talked about interlocking processes often initiated quite independently from one another. Mikoła Borowik, whose paper you haven't heard but I have read, suggests that from his sources, interviews with Ukrainians about their wartime experience, the term collaboration may not fit or be applicable at all. I want to suggest, though, that the term or at least the concept of collaboration is quite essential and worth keeping. Although, as I say, you may have to ponder which vocabulary makes the most sense. But I think the concept of collaboration is essential because it draws our attention to the ways that the Holocaust was a participatory project, a project that drew together Germans and non-Germans, that linked through networks of power, choice, action, unforeseen consequences, people in all kinds of centers and peripheries of power, local administrators, police, family members, and many, many others. In other words, the notion of collaboration, I think, gives us the possibility to think about power, and violence, initiative, moving in more than one direction, in more than two directions, in fact, in multiple directions. So what I'm calling for is really a reconceptualization of collaboration, not as a point, a point of judgment, not even simply as a line, like a spectrum that goes from, say, passivity to killing, but something that would be conceptualized like a space, a space that's intersected by a number of different vectors that might include everything from killing to rescue. We've seen it in our papers, right? That might include intentional participation. People have talked about intent or systematic collaboration to quite unknowing participation or to acts that had an unforeseen result of contributing to uh, Nazi German processes of destruction and killing. In other words, what look like binary oppositions between complicity and resistance, for instance, when studied and analyzed, can be seen as connected in very complex ways. Think about the very first paper we heard in our conference by Ivan Kachanovsky talking about Ukrainian nationalists, the OUN and the UPA, more than two-thirds of whom moved from participation in police forces involved in German killing to active leadership roles in Ukrainian nationalist resistance. So I think these spectrums between coercion, willingness, chaotic involvement, systematic involvement, they need to be incorporated into one frame. And also crucial is a chronological vector that has to run through that space that connects not only the period before 1941, what about those crucial years, 1939 to 1941, when that Judeo-Bolshevik myth that was so useful 
to propagandists after 1941 was not really available in the period of Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. This period needs to be connected. So does the pre-war, so does the post-war. But we also need to be mindful of the ways that acts, maybe even the same act, could have a completely different resonance before 1942, for instance, and after. So thinking about the space of collaboration, it seems to me we can also note how the politicization of the term or the many politics of the term or the concept that change over time can be analyzed. As indeed, Irene Sklokina has done in her paper, which you'll hear tomorrow, on the Soviet case. But I'm also suggesting that this space, collaboration conceptualized as a space, not a line or a point, delineates a historical phenomenon where actions, power, relations, people, knowingly or unknowingly, helped Nazi Germans projects of destruction, in particular, destruction of the Jews, a project that, in hindsight, appears limited to Europe, but looking in the opposite direction, was limited not by the ambition of Nazi German leaders, but only by the war that they eventually lost. And here I want to draw special attention to those colleagues, Alexander Prusen and Oleg um, Ratushniak, who emphasized the centrality of the war, because I think the topic of collaboration cannot be separated from the course of the war. So let's think about some of those linkages, some of those linkages. I gave this talk the title, Collaboration with Whom? The Presence and Absence of Germans in the East, because it seemed to me important to emphasize, although many of you have done that, that although collaboration is such an important topic, there's that central magnetic pull of German power that set the terms in many ways for what collaboration would be and what forms it would take. And by the way, I do want to make one maybe seemingly pedantic point, but it seems to be quite important to emphasize that it was not the Nazis, but the Germans who invaded Poland in 1939, Soviet territories in 1941, it's so interesting to me as someone trained as a Germanist, you know, we had this debate with the Daniel Goldhagen book in the 90s to talk about Nazis or to talk about Germans. But this debate is much older. It started already during the war itself. It was a debate, for example, within the American um, war information services. Nazis or Germans, can they be separated? Eastern Europeanists, I think, seem to have inherited this one thing from the Cold War era of only referring to Nazis. I've noticed you can read entire articles, sometimes entire books, where the word German never appears. So let me make that plea. Coming in, for example, as I do from Canada, much as I might like to talk about things like um, the dispatch of conservative troops to Afghanistan, no one would do that, right? So if you think about military actions, these are national, um, national actions, national actions. So the linkage to Germany, absolutely crucial. The German priority, certainly by the end of 1941, on killing Jews over other projects of destruction and killing, that exerted a very powerful pull and it's not a coincidence that for all of the many regional, local, and national variations that we've heard about, that we'll hear about, that all of you know about, one thing occurred everywhere that German power reached during World War II, and that was the destruction of Jewish lives and Jewish communities, a project that continued um, after the war. To think about this magnetic pull. I want to read you a short excerpt that, in fact, I came across in my teaching just the other day, um, from a short story, The Old Teacher, written by Vasily Grossman during the war, before the war was over. And 
Grossman puts the following words into the mouth of the character of a teacher in the story, a Jewish character, a knowledgeable reader would recognize it. As he sits with a friend awaiting the arrival of the Germans in, a Ukrainian, in the Ukrainian village where they live. It's a very short quote. There's one thing I fear more than anything, said the teacher, that the people among whom I've lived my whole life, the people I love and trust, that this people will be taken in by a vile, cheap lie. No, said Voronenko, it won't be like that. The night was dark because heavy clouds had covered the sky and shut out the light of the stars. And it was dark from the darkness of the earth. The Nazis were a great falsehood, life's greatest falsehood. Wherever they passed, up from the depths rose cowardice, treachery, murderousness, and violence against the weak. Nazis drew everything dark up to the surface, just as a black spell in an old tale calls up the spirits of evil. That night, the little town lay stifling, gripped by something foul and dark. Something vile had awoken. Stirred by the Nazis' arrival, it was now reaching toward them. It's a kind of mystical, you could say, overblown, you know, Soviet-era story about the war, but it seems to me it strikes on something very important. Again, that magnetic pull of a system that, especially through years of violence, pulled out many different capabilities um, within the societies that it touched. One of the great, I think, achievements of many of the papers at this conference has been to try to put some concrete, let's say, vectors to this notion of the magnetic pole or the force field um, of Nazi German domination. We've seen, for instance, in Regina Fritz's paper, the importance of local administrators in ghettoization in 1944 Hungary. We've seen in a number of papers, on the uh, number of papers, the importance of police. Just now, we heard from Alphonse Adam, Jan Lanicek, and Tom Friedel. But if you think about those three papers, you see the very different ways that they analyzed this vector connecting police with the Germans. In Alphonse Adam's paper, it seemed to me one crucial explanation for the behavior of the police was that they got used to, they got used to it, they got used to it. They dealt with Jews, they dealt with Roma, and by the time they were dealing with Czech civilians, they were used to their task of serving um, a certain uh, cause of brutality. In Jan's paper, the notion of duty uh, becomes paramount, an idea that links pre-war with the post-war, and that also, of course, suggests why, after the war, other policemen would not have been so eager to see police who were simply doing their duty prosecuted or singled out. Tom's paper on the blue police in Poland is the most, I think, striking in connection to this point about the impact of German power and the mutuality of power relations, because Tom suggested that in killing Jews, especially in 1943, Polish blue police in the countryside were responding to acts of German terror, not in their own communities, but in communities nearby. So in other words, they took a kind of preemptive strike to kill Jews who in their minds not only were already dead, since Jews had been removed, killed, um, in the Operation Reinhardt killing program, those left were just, in a sense, a coincidence, but that those remaining Jews had also become a kind of walking time bomb that embodied the self-fulfilling prophecy of Nazi German destruction. Another vector of this linkage, again, in two directions between the Germans and others, we've seen in many different papers that I think is often neglected, is the vector of forced labor, 
Think about how many papers have talked about the role of police, of local administrators, but also you'll see it tomorrow, even of families in making decisions of who would be sent as forced laborers to Germany. Very important point. Again, that shows the Holocaust embedded in other processes of um, destruction, destruction of communities. Mirna Zakic's paper drew our attention to the Volksdeutschen, ethnic Germans, as another kind of vector connecting the Germans inside Germany and those outside um, with the sometimes fabricated uh, German populations in occupied and allied and client uh, areas. And here, I think, her point about the force of ambiguity, the ambiguous nature of the definition of Germanness itself, draws our attention to the ambiguity of all of the so-called racial categories and shows a way in which ideology and pragmatism, rather than being two opposing poles, were intertwined, mutually reinforcing, um, and that the contradictions and flexibilities of Nazi ideology and practice made it in many cases shockingly adaptable and also perhaps easy to drop at the end of the war. One might ponder that question. The final of these vectors I want to draw your attention to that we've heard a lot of talk about, of course, is property. Property. Very interesting papers yesterday, for instance, by Anders Blomqvist, by Hanna Kubatova, showing not only, maybe one could say, the predictable, argu predictable argument of greed as a factor um, in destruction of Jews, but some rather unpredictable dimensions where expectations of Jewish wealth meshed with notions of an international Jewish conspiracy, where religious ideas or old anti-Semitic stereotypes offered a kind of moral inversion, where Jewish victims could be re, um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, could be revised in the minds of their attackers as the villains rather than the victims. So property as a kind of site, not only of simple one-way transactions, but of a kind of unleashing moral justifications and inversions that in turn justified uh, further violence and bound people, as Hannah suggested, to the regimes. Um, Philip, I think in his, not in the paper, but in answering the question, um, Philip Erdeliac drew attention to a related dynamic where partisan attacks often, in a sense, had the effect of convincing people who had been perhaps agnostic about the Ustasha, now that their family had been attacked, or now that perhaps they felt threatened in their properties, even properties they had looted, they had a stake in maintaining an existing system. So the presence, the absence of Germans mediated through all of these um, different, all of these different vectors. We've heard, of course, about the ways in which the other agendas of many of the collaborators changed, transformed, challenged, coexisted with German projects of uh, destruction. And maybe I'll skip over that uh, quickly. But I want to draw attention to the ways in which, again, all of those confluences served to make Jews even more vulnerable, right? So even though there are other priorities, Serbs in some case, Czechs in some case, Muslims in some cases, um, somehow the confluence always ended up putting Jews in the position of maximum vulnerability. We had two very interesting papers on the Roma, two very interesting papers by Slavomir Kapralski, Daniel Vojak, both of which showed ways in which persecution of the Roma was in many ways a matter of much more local and regional initiative, um, less cooperation with Germans and their partners. And indeed, Slavomir gave us the idea of a chaotic genocide, I think an extremely important concept which, by the way, 
fits in some ways with thinking about uh, Jews as well. Some connections that maybe we began to analyze but could use further analysis are the issues of intellectual collaboration, which Victoria Sulvanovich opened up for us with a study of the press, issues of religion, Fielder and others talked about that. I was interested in the ways in which Christianity, a religion, of course, that both united and divided Europe, featured almost in like snapshot appearances in almost every paper, but with the exception of Fielder's paper, and even there, was not really analyzed as a factor in processes of collaboration. Janis Skalidakis' paper about Crete made the rather, I thought, unusual point that in cases of local committees in charge of forced labor, the priest was a standing member of such committees. Doesn't that strike you as an unusual choice? Um, so the point of the role of Christianity, something that I think can require more analysis, um, and it comes up in many places. Another theme that essentially moves around the edges of many, many of our papers is the theme of family. And I think family is a key site of linkages involved in processes of collaboration, complicity, benefiting, enabling, facilitating, whatever terms um, you want to use. Andrea Peto's um, paper, which you'll hear tomorrow, is the only one that thematizes gender specifically, and it's not surprising that family plays an important role there as well, as it does in Natalia Alexiun's paper um, and others. But it seems that the family was both a site of vulnerability during the war and after the war, as Tatiana Pashluchenko points out, where post-war justice could focus on a family as a whole, but family is also a site of sharing property, covering up, protecting the reputations of family members. So family, I think, a very important and complex um, topic under, under analyzed. Also important, and again, only touched on in a number of our papers, is the subject of intimacy in particular of sexual intimacy. If you think about the image of collaboration I mentioned to you at the beginning, to me at least it seems quite odd that collaboration in the West is often embodied in the figure of a woman with a shaved head accused of the so-called horizontal collaboration, right, sex with the enemy, a very different image of collaboration um, from in the East where sex, if referred to, is almost always in the context of accusations of sexual violence, right, rape. So you think, why the bifurcation? In the West, Regina Mulhäuser has made this observation, in the West, sex, a sex in wartime associated with consent, a kind of treasonous consent by weak-willed women. In the East, sex, a kind of way to express the viciousness, the brutality um, of the enemy. Perhaps one of our jobs studying the topic of collaboration is to try to link those histories of Eastern and Western Europe. It's one reason I was so grateful for the papers we had on uh, Croatia, on Serbia, on Greece, papers that helped geographically to bridge this gap. But it's a gap that I think really weakens the field um, because Eastern and Western Europe, of course, were part of the same history. Whose East and whose West was it anyways? The Germans, of course. Ideas, practices, and people moved back and forth across what in the Cold War seemed like an uncrossable um, divide. And again, I could give examples, but I'm gonna move ahead quickly. I wanna say a little bit about taboos around the topic. At the beginning, I told you that this is an uncomfortable topic. Well, I think I'll make it even more uncomfortable. The topic of collaboration, of course, is surrounded with taboos. It deals with honor, with shame, national honor and national shame. And often, no matter what context you come from, 
You might experience that there are two discourses. You might talk about collaboration in one way with people on the inside, and another sort of external discourse for others. Um, even the language of treason is used against scholars themselves, and I'm sure you can all think of people who work in this field who've had that charge leveled against them. I think it's important um, for scholars to push against these kind of taboos, to engage the topic in all its complexity. And perhaps one of the advantages of conceptualizing collaboration separate from rigid notions of intent is that it may also allow us to talk about the subject of Jewish involvement in processes of destruction. Of course, there have been plenty of remarks and um, accounts over the years about Jewish councils, Jewish police. These two have been instrumentalized in efforts to blame the victims in anti-Zionist attacks. Irina talks about this in her paper. Rand Tilburg maligned for comments on these subjects. But in a way, these topics don't go away, and right now they're particularly in the air, you might say. Perhaps some of you have already had a chance to see Claude Lanzmann's new film about Mermelstein, which I have not yet seen. Perhaps some of you are familiar with the debates around Agata Tuchinska's book, Vera Gran, about the Jewish singer in the Warsaw Ghetto who was accused after the war by her accompanist, Vladislav Spielmann, of collaborating with the Gestapo and the issues that have come up around there. And by the way, thinking about questions of scapegoating, it's perhaps not a coincidence that Lanzmann's film in some way rehabilitates Mermelstein, I understand, whereas the debate about Tuchinska's book has um, slammed not only Vera Gran, but her as well. Interest and a sense of the importance of this subject dates back to the war itself and to the earliest accounts from Jewish sources of the Holocaust. Recently, I read a memoir by Eli Pfefferkorn, who lives in Toronto, who talked about a labor camp in Western Poland that he was in as a teenager, where the camp was run by Jewish prisoners under German supervision. I found an account of the very same camp in David Boder's 1946 interview with Abe Moanbloom. This subject is not addressed, but it's an important subject because it draws our attention to the totality of destruction involved with the Holocaust, a destruction that no one could live with and escape, in a sense, unscathed. Hermann Crook, the diarist of the Vilna Ghetto, wrote in his diary that on the graves of the innocent, poison flowers bloom. Emmanuel Ringelblum in the Warsaw Ghetto, when asked, should we also include in our histories of the ghetto discussions of blackmailers, of denouncers, he said, yes, we have to tell everything. Only in this way will our history be credible. Perhaps if he had survived the war, he would have edited out some of that material. But looking forward, understanding those dynamics were also important for the people who lived in that time as they were for Jewish survivors who, even in the DP camps, established courts to try to sort out for themselves and among themselves which kinds of choices were really choiceless choices at which people might have had um, some room for maneuver. Let me say a few final words about sources and our job as scholars. I think the discomfort of the subject of collaboration is embedded in the sources themselves. Many of the papers we hear in this conference use sources from trials and investigations. Sources, of course, that are steeped in post-war agendas and that require a special kind of reading and understanding. Perpetrators' sources from the war itself tend to either over or under report non-German involvement for complex reasons. It doesn't make them unuseful, but it makes them um, needing a careful analysis. So-called collaborators themselves, why would they record their actions? And in fact, the sources of the victims precisely on this subject are essential, right? An integrated history is crucial right here. 
I was gratified when in our conference the first question came from someone who identified himself as a survivor. And I want to say I think there are many more Jewish sources, not all of them, by the way, survivor sources, sources produced in the war that could be utilized in this field. I just taught a class with my colleague Anna Sternschus, professor of Yiddish. She drew my attention to so many wartime Yiddish sources, and I think with the possible exception of Natalia's paper, I don't think one of the papers of this conference has used um, such material. Um, of course, the sources of the victims, too, as we heard, are often silent or reticent on the subject of collaboration. After all, particularly when people had to live together afterwards, there were reasons not to want to draw attention to this topic. And perhaps there are broader reasons not to wish to live in a world where one feels surrounded by enemies. It's not a coincidence, I think, that the subject of rescue in many ways is inextricably intertwined with the topic of collaboration. Precisely because the whole notion of the righteous among the nations was initiated, by the way, even before the war ended, by Jews, including survivors, who understood the importance of existing in a world where they could say there were people who helped. If you think about that category, it often erases the complex networks that constituted acts of rescue, survival over years by reducing attention to one heroic, so-called righteous Christian individual. But that discourse itself is quite important um, for, again, allowing life in a post-war life in a post-war uh, world. But there, too, if you think about the moment we exist in right now, you can see there's a kind of craze for studies about rescue and resistance. Uh, recently, I heard a paper by René Poznanski analyzing some popular materials in France where, you know, an entire discourse about collaboration of France has been flipped on its head to present everyone who ever, you know, I don't know, showed up for work late as, you know, a heroic res a resistor who helped to save Jews. And here, too, you can see the popular pressures that exist on our field. Um, on the one hand, the importance of these categories. On the other hand, the need for scholars to ponder both their historical sort of significance and the creation of the images that we're surrounded with now. So I guess that brings me to the job of the scholar. Raoul Hilberg once said, we have studied the Holocaust out of the limelight and in the limelight. It was more difficult, he concluded, in the limelight. We are studying in the limelight. Here we are, as was remarked earlier today, in a palace, the Ministry of Justice. One could say that's quite a comfortable position to study the Holocaust. But it seems to me it's also, in some ways, awkward and uncomfortable. The subject of collaboration in particular. First of all, so much suffering. Think about some of the papers that we've heard. It's terrible to contemplate the reality of these sources and these materials. There's, it seems to me, a kind of shame that can go along with being a scholar in this field, a shame, as Primo Levi put it, for the world. What does it mean to live in such a world? But there's some other awkward roles of the scholar, too. It's easy, it seems to me, in this field for the scholar to turn into the accuser, the scold, the finger wagger, and sometimes, as a result, a pariah. On the flip side, I think precisely with these topics, scholars can become mouthpieces for special interests, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly, a subject like collaboration easily instrumentalized as the subject of rescue. And of course, as we've heard, the papers have reminded us, the topic, though decades in the past, the history we're studying, is still so raw. When you hear about mass graves, right, still being found in Romania or in Ukraine, um, and even in, you know, sleepy Canada, when I think of uh, my sister-in-law once asking me to talk to a friend of hers who wanted to know whether his uncle 
could really have just been a translator working for an Einsatzkommando. His uncle was Helmut Oberlander, subsequently deported from Canada, the Einsatzkommando 10A. You can see that this history is not really past. It's very, very raw. And that has its discomfort too. A discomfort that maybe follows us into this beautiful and comfortable room. So I guess what I would say is, maybe collaboration should be an uncomfortable topic. Maybe this is the state of the field that we have to learn to live with. And perhaps the comfort that we have comes precisely from the chance to share that discomfort um, with others who think along with us. Thank you. Now we do have time for questions and comments, ample time. So I invite those of you who have questions or comments. So while you think about it, I have a question that I would ask you to develop a little further, Doris. You talked about bridging the gap between East and West. And I have to say, I've, I've wrestled with this myself as director of a Scholar Center at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. And sometimes the question that I ask is, what is it that bridges East to West in this topic? And one, one way to think about it, of course, is the subject of Christian continent. Different forms of Christianity, different practices, but a Christian continent. In a, in a more provocative moment, I, I once said, well, you know, Europe was united in thinking that this project was a good project and that theft was a good thing. And the fact that it has taken so many decades to deal with restitution issues, comfort with the notion that together we might not deal with restitution issues, made people quite angry. Uh, from, a, from a scholar's perspective, from your perspective, what are the lines that might lead us to better see the unity of the, the continent in this time period? If it's okay, I want to answer from here because I can see um, the audience better. I think it's such an important uh, question. And it seems to me there are a whole bunch of different vectors and they often um, are forgotten. One has to do with the study of Jewish history. Study of Jewish history. Again, as I mentioned, I just taught a class with my colleague Anna Sternschus, and one of the themes of our class was called the Holocaust in literature. And we didn't use any literature written after 1948. So our goal was to use things written at the time and to try to think like people looking forward, groping into that unknown, right? Rather than looking back with the wisdom or the ignorance, perhaps, of, of hindsight. But one of the themes that came across so clearly in that course was the importance of refugees, movement of refugees. And I think often stereotypically, people have this idea that, oh, Western European Jews were all highly assimilated. Eastern European Jews, they all lived in shtetls. Well, if you know anything about anything, you know that that doesn't make any sense at all. It's a really ser pretty serious overgeneralization. But you also know, well, I'll just give you one statistic. Belgium in 1940, when the Germans took over Belgium in 1940, 95% of the Jews in Belgium were foreign born. 95%. Because many had come as refugees repeatedly, right, after the Russian Revolution, in the interwar period, and then after Hitler came to power, and even after 1939, some of them hoping to get out past Belgium, but ending up trapped there by the war. So you have, first of all, a Jewish population, many of whom in their families and linkages linked East and West. Think about, I mean, there's so many examples. Maybe some of you are familiar with uh, Eddie Hillisum, Eddie Hillisum, who's, you know, beautiful, like, diary, a life interrupted. Her letters from Westerbork are used by many people teaching classes about the Holocaust. Dutch Jewish woman, Eddie Hillisum, was fluent in Russian. She was a student of Russian literature. 
Why was she fluent in Russian? Her mother was Russian. How about Sarah Kaufman, one of the great, you know, French philosophers of the 20th century, such an important person, survivor of the Holocaust, in some way used often to sort of think about France and France during the Holocaust. Her family was from Poland. So I think, first of all, like that, to be attentive to the fact that this East-West divide, it's often imposed, you know what I mean, in an unrealistic way. So that's one thing. And then, of course, if you think about the differences so striking up until, let's say, July 1942. If you think about after the roundups of July 1942 in Paris, suddenly the situation in particular of those foreign-born Jews in France was not so different from their maybe relatives or not relatives um, who were still alive in Poland. So I think that's one really important linkage is to think that way. And the other is to think about the Germans themselves who moved very freely across those borders and you know, who were posted in, well, I can give again a specific example, People posted in Poland in 1939, who experienced a brutal assault on Poland in 1939, went to France in 1940, then deployed in the attack on Soviet territories in 1941. But even just one specific example, um, maybe some of you are familiar with the massacre of thousands of French black soldiers in June 1940 by the um, Wehrmacht where, you know, French black soldiers separated out from their white counterparts, many of them summarily shot, uh, killed with uh, grenades. Um, the same officers who in some cases carried out those shootings or who to allowed or told their soldiers to do so, were then in many cases involved in 1941, a year later, in a much larger killing of prisoners of war, in this case, Soviet prisoners of war. So practices, you know, move back and forth, maybe smaller, but then larger. Or one other example, think about the murder of the disabled, something that, by the way, with the exception of Alexander Korb, passing comment, never came up in this entire conference. It's interesting, right? The first German mass killing project, murder of the disabled. What happened to the people trained in that program, deployed to set up killing centers in the East? So I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot of vectors um, that connect East and West. And yeah, there's a kind of mindset that I guess came out of the Cold War of seeing those things as so separate. And even, you know, the idea of like the peasantry, the sort of the primitive Eastern European peasantry. I mean, Western Europe was pretty agricultural you know, in this period too. So I think, yeah, sometimes we're reading back from subsequent realities. Yes, sir. And can I ask you, just hold the microphone close to, to you Thank so you. that we can uh, hear. Richard Desmond, said, University of Illinois. Um, you're just talking about some of the things that pull East and West together, and I, I do uh, think that's valuable, but one thing that kind of separates them. Uh, you were talking about the examples of collaboration moving from the uh, shaved head woman to the Polish peasant. Another example that seemed to be lurking there, I think you were talking about the 1980s, would be the police spy maybe in the meeting that's discussing the Holocaust or whatever. So uh, we see the issue of collaboration with uh, communist era secret police as still a factor. I mean, uh, the scholarly work on this subject, I think, has complicated that resistance collaboration dynamic in that context over the past couple of decades. But still, in politics, uh, it seems to be a rather a, a stark line. So my question is, uh, especially in Eastern or former uh, Eastern Bloc uh, region, how do you think the question of collaboration in the Holocaust uh, intersects with this question of resistance and collaboration uh, during the state socialist era? Okay, let me just make sure because I can't hear that well that I understood your question correctly. Did you ask about how the question of resistance and collaboration in the Holocaust intersects with questions about resistance and collaboration under communism? Yeah, okay. Huh. 
This really is a good question, which a person always says when they're trying to think of a good answer. Um, yeah, boy, there are so many things to be said about that question. I mean, one is, I think it's so important to think about national socialism and communism as overlapping in time and space. You know what I mean? I mean, anyone who works in this field, I'm sure you've all had this question asked, you know, students, we always put it in the mouth of students, but lots of other people have asked me, who was worse, Hitler or Stalin? And I would say both, right? Because the fact that they coexist, it exacerbates as a mutually reinforcing effect. And I think in that same sort of linked way, these discourses of resistance and collaboration for sure are, for sure are linked. And I mean, in an obvious way, you can say, look, think about the Cold War period, the two Germanys, the mutual recriminations, right, of, you know, on the one hand, the East Germans saying to the West, look, you people took in all those fascists that print out the Brown Book and say, here's the jobs that they hold, here's the responsible positions. You know, you're the continuation of fascism. The West Germans, you know, going to the East, seeing, you know, the goose stepping, right? There was sort of a shock, right? The um, Stasi state, you know, you people, totalitarian dictatorships. So it was quite a useful um, way to both deflect and attack at the same time. And I think that discourse in the 80s was, um, was really widespread, was really pervasive, not just in the Germanys. Um, and of course now, now you have the whole interesting question about, well, is it really a dual genocide? You know, I was saying in a question the other day, we just had a conference at the University of Toronto about the Holocaust in Lithuania. And you know, the whole debate about, well, is part of accepting in some way, let's say the role of Lithuanian, you know, Gentiles in the killing of Jews in Lithuania, is part of that sort of accepting, yes, but what about, you know, the suffering under um, Soviet domination, both before and then communist rule after. And so much as a person might think, well, these are two separate issues. They're not. They're linked all the time in people's imaginations and discourses, and even in people's experiences. You know, I'll just give one example. Um, Years ago, I bought a pair of glasses, you know, from a guy who said to me, what do you work on? I said, Holocaust. He said, I'll tell you about the Holocaust. And then he told me, you know, his father was Russian Jew, went to France in the 1930s, but of course ended up getting caught in, you know, after the German occupation, survived in France in some labor camp, but then ended up in British hands and got repatriated to the Soviet Union where he died in a gulag. So you think like, and there's many, many, many such people, right? So I think the discourses, they're, yeah, there's a really, what can I say, delicate um, way in which they can slide into denial, attack, mutual recrimination. But there's also, I think, a historical link that has to be um, acknowledged and, you know, can't sort of be simply swept away with the claim of, well, this was worse because it lasted longer, or this was worse because it had more victims. I mean, it's a, it's a thorny issue that smart people like in this room have to keep thinking about. Yes, ma'am. Imke Hansen, Hugo Valentin Center, Uppsala University. Um, thank you for, for that really inspiring and, and dense um, keynote. I was especially thankful that you draw our attention to the title of the conference, to the difference between collaboration and uh, co-perpetrationship, mittäterschaft. It's not that we don't have in German the term collaboration. So I was quite surprised when I saw it. And I was also thankful to Paul Shapiro, I already, already talked to you about that, that you brought up this, um, well, this lexical jungle we are moving in between uh, and also Swavomir brought it up between um, profit and involvement and uh, yeah and perpetratorship or co-perpetratorship um, you brought up two examples which made me think that it might have to do a lot with the concept of responsibility even though you didn't mention that in your talk uh, it was Tom's Tom's um, example sorry of of the blue police, they took responsibility 
for the community, for the village, for the security of the village, which meant to become perpetrators and kill the Jews. And you also mentioned the the f like families who had to decide themselves who they sent to Germany as slave laborers, as forced laborers. So the yeah, the collaborators delegated this responsibility to the families and they became co-responsible for a decision for an administrative act. So did they become collaborators, though being victims? I just wanted to ask you, um, what do you think about um, the, like to which extent does the conception of uh, responsibility make enlighten this jungle and uh, to which extent is it operable to a theoretical, um, Address, uh, addressing this, uh, the question of collaboration and the other terms. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's an interesting thing to think about because in a way I was trying to move away from that framework precisely by trying to, does this sound too terrible, to decenter the notion of intent. Decenter the notion of intent. You know, any of you have ever done any work in genocide studies, you'll know there's so much discussion about intent, right? For legal discussion, intent is really important. For historical analysis, it seems to me intent is really problematic. We don't have very good ways of getting at intent. We can't really measure it. And often in thinking about trying to analyze a dynamic or a mechanism or outcomes, Intent isn't that important. Um, and I think intent and responsibility are linked in some quite important ways. Um, but I still want to say, so in a way, I was trying to think more about looking at the process, not so much in a legal or even in a moral frame, but trying to think, how did the system function? How did it function? But that said, there is something really important, I think, about your question about responsibility. And that has to do with the strange, I think, mismatch between who claims responsibility and who doesn't. I'm not thinking about these police here, but I'm thinking about if you read um, many Jewish survivor accounts, especially early ones, but late ones too, you often see a trope where people say, it was all my fault. It was all my fault. I myself pushed my son into the gas chamber. That's famous from this um, Olga Lingyel uh, account, Seven Chimneys. What did she do? She arrived there at Auschwitz. She told her son, who was 13, to go with her mother, his grandmother. And of course, they were sent to the gas. At some level, you know, she knew that she didn't kill the son. Of course she did. But it was important, it seems to me, kind of morally, to sort of maintain some notion of agency, that I'm still, you know, a moral agent, I'm looking back, I'm trying to figure out what happened. It's a way of sort of claiming some control over a person's fate in a situation that's completely hopeless. Whereas if you look at people who had enormous amounts of power, I think about Franz Stangl, you know, Commandant, first of Sobibor and Treblinka, you know, and you see over and over again their claim, I could do nothing. I was powerless. So the whole dichotomy of responsibility is really, I think, historically interesting and analytically interesting. But I don't think there's a one-on-one -on -one measure between who takes responsibility for what. Because, you know, and what form, there's different ways of taking responsibility. There's a way which says, um, I claim, you know, ownership over this act, but I understand that I didn't really control it. There's another way, and maybe that's what um, those blue police were doing in some way, of saying, I know that my community wants me, you know, to take this, um, and I take it as part of a shared kind of mutual understanding between us. So I think it's really, I think it's really complex. And maybe a philosopher could do better than me to answer. So I do not see other hands. I think that means that our speaker wrapped things and into all things very, very effectively for us. Uh, as we close, and we are at the end of a quite long day here, I just want to remind the conference participants that in the package that you received, there's an invitation for an event this evening. There's a bus that will leave for that event from in front of this building at 6.30 sharp.
So we have a bit of time to relax uh, before then, but please be in front of the building at 6.30 sharp, and we begin again tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock. I would ask you all to join me in thanking Doris Bergen for this wonderful wrap-up for us.